At 2 p.m. today, outreach workers from Roof Above did an assessment of the site to determine how many people were still remaining. We estimate that between 15 and 20 people are still at the site. The county has not turned anyone away who was known to be in the North End and Camden area and did not have another resource. As I indicated yesterday, this is a community problem and I am extremely proud and humbled by the support we have received from the community. I would like to thank our nonprofit partners, Salvation Army, Supportive Housing Communities and Roof Above, our grassroots organizations that have been on the ground for months and assisting with relocation, Block Love Charlotte, Hearts Beat as One Foundation, Hearts for the Invisible, Leah's Hopes and Dreams, Just Do It Movement, and Project Outpour. I would like to thank Mohamed Genetian, President of the Hospitality and Tourism Alliance, who contacted me yesterday after the news conference to offer assistance through transportation companies that are members of his association. With that, I would like to thank Peak Limousine, Yellow Cab, and Crown Cab for their assistance and generosity. Transportation services were provided at no cost to the county. I would also like to thank our hotel partner who's been working with the county for almost a year. His responsiveness to the needs of this community has been truly inspiring. Finally, I'd like to thank the county employees that have been working tirelessly on this effort, including Anthony Trotman, Deputy County Manager, Karen Pelletier from Community Support Services, Robert Nesbitt from the County Manager's Office, John Eller, Greg Tanner, Richard Buchanan, and our MTS bus drivers from the Department of Social Services who continue to provide transportation services, and the employees from Community Support Services and Public Health who are staffing the hotels and providing support services to our guests. At this point, we do not have a firm number of people that have refused our offer of a hotel room. However, in the event that, we, that there are, we will encourage them to collect their belongings, leave the encampment site, and relocate elsewhere so the site can be cleaned and the infestation eradicated. As has always been the case, outreach workers from Roof Above will continue to work with this population and encourage their acceptance of services. At 5 p.m. today, the property owners are required to begin the process of cleaning the area, which includes removal of all garbage, tents, and tarps. They must engage a pest control company to eradicate the rodents and submit an eradication plan to public health. Once the plan is approved, eradication can begin and the work will be monitored and inspected by public health. The guests at the hotel will be provided with comprehensive wraparound services. Every effort will be made to transition them to permanent housing. Thank you and with that I will open it up for questions. First question today is Joe Bruno, WSOC TV. Hey there, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the next 72 hours? Do the does the entire encampment have to be cleaned out by then or is there some leeway there if they hire a pest control company? Gibby, do you want to take that? Happy to. Um, the abatement order requires that they have the area cleaned within 72 hours and that pest control has been contacted and a contract is in place with a plan to um, begin the eradication. In our conversations with all of the owners of the property at this point in time indicate that they are working on the plan. Um, most will have those to us by tomorrow morning at the latest in terms of eradication and all of them are beginning uh, the cleanup process as of eight o'clock tomorrow morning. So we anticipate that they will be able to get the property completely cleaned within 72 hours. And depending on the amount of infestation on the properties, uh, we'll have to wait until we see the plans from pest control to see how long that will take. Next question is Courtney Cole, WBTV. Thank you for taking my question. I spoke to a man earlier who's already gone to the hotel, but he says there's been some issues as far as people trying to get back from the hotel to Tent City to collect any belongings. What is the best strategy for them? Is it taking the van? Are there bus tickets provided? What do they need to do if they need to get back to Tent City or to work or anywhere else? So yeah, so we're working with our community partners that are going to be staffing the hotel and providing bus transportation or bus tickets for individuals. Uh, we are working to get uh, to determine what that actual need is and making sure that we are there to help support those efforts. 
Next question is Lana Harris, WCNC. Hi there. So I know there's not currently a plan in place for beyond these 90 days, but are you working on creating a plan? Are you going to make a committee um, calling other cities or are there in, any empty buildings you guys are considering using that could be uh, a more permanent solution beyond these 90 days? Or is the expectation to get this cleaned up and then they just kind of go back out there again? Or, or, or where do you guys see this going? Thanks. So I, I didn't hear probably 80% of your question, but I'm thinking, I think you're asking me about what the long-term strategy is, if, if I heard you correctly. And so right now we will keep uh, folks at the hotels and we will be working on uh, trying to provide permanent supportive housing for those who need it or, or permanent housing that regular permanent housing for people who need it. Um, and we will, you know, work with our community partners and others to do what we can to help facilitate that. Uh, what I said yesterday, and I'll say it again today is, you know, we really, hope that our landlords will step up and help facilitate um, helping us find units so we can put some of these folks. So, um, but we, you know, we're committed to trying to find a permanent solution. I don't anticipate that we're going to open up an empty parking lot or anything like that. I think we're going to try to do what we can to find permanent supportive housing for these folks. Mm -hmm. Next question, Drew Belia, WCCB. Hello, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, so what communications have you all had with uh, the city and the other property owners there? And do you expect them to have more participation uh, in this effort moving forward? When you, when you say this effort, does that mean in terms of the cleanup? No, that means more in terms of per finding the permanent housing uh, and, and providing the resources for the folks who, who have been moved. Well, we don't anticipate that the property owners um, specifically, except maybe for the city who actually is in the business of affordable housing would be part of the permanent solution. Karen, do you have any additional comments on that? I mean, I would say that the roof above is one of our permanent supportive housing uh, partners and that we would be working with them and making sure that we're, we're helping to connect people to resources that that organization has. Thank you. And then what communications have you had with the city and other property owners? So our environmental health staff is working with all of the property owners, which includes the city. They are one of the property owners about their, um, their plans for cleanup um, and their plans for eradication of the rats. That's what, that's the conversation we've had with them so far. And um, they are all having conversation with, us about what their future plans are in terms of uh, their property and concerns about um, future encampments. Um, but at this point, there's, you know, they're all working their separate plans. A few of them uh, are attempting to work together on this process um, and others are developing their own plans. But um, our main effort right now is making sure that they are moving forward with uh, the plans for cleanup and uh, the rodent eradication. Next question is Lauren Lindstrom, Charlotte Observer. Hi, Dina. I was hoping you could expand on something you said earlier about um, nobody was turned away if they were not previously, or anyone who was like affiliated previously with the North End Camp or didn't have another resource. And I was wondering what those other resources might be. And if that's the case, were there folks turned away for some reason that we wouldn't understand. So, yeah, so this effort was not designed to solve homelessness in Mecklenburg County. It was designed to relocate people from a specific situation that was not safe for them um, or for this community. And so what we didn't want to do is just, you know, relocate anybody who walked up to us saying that they wanted a hotel room. And so we did have to triage uh, people who actually were impacted by the encampment and others who actually just we came up and, and wanted a place to stay. And I don't have the exact numbers and maybe Karen can provide that. Um, so when we talk about people who are impacted by the encampment, those are the people who we focused on and nobody who qualified under that uh, criteria was turned away. Correct. And so the, I didn't, we don't have the exact number of people that weren't in that area that were turned away. What I will say is that we know that at least 12 families came to Roof Above seeking a hotel room. 
We know for certain that they were not in that encampment, that they'd been living in other parts of town around Charlotte. And so we were able to work in real time with Salvation Army to make sure that every single one of those families with children were able to access shelter through the Salvation Army's hotel project. Next question, Stephanie Escobar, Spectrum News. Hi, yes, I have a question for Dina and a question for Gibby. My question for Gibby is, what is the risk of people staying at that encampment with a rodent infestation? And the question for Dina is, what happens after 5 p.m.? Is there going to be any enforcement if people remain at the encampment? Well, the risk um, has been the same since the beginning of this discussion and the, the beginning of the the order is that rats, rodents um, tend to carry diseases and people who are living among them are exposed to those diseases, whether that's through direct contact with the rats, with bites, or with exposure to feces and urine. So the people continuing to live on that site until the rats are eradicated would continue to increase their potential for exposure to diseases um, that we would prefer not to um, experience in this community. The other concern that we have about that site, and we've talked about this as well, is the threat to the greater public um, around that area, because these rodents, as we clean out these sites, number one, they're going to be moving to look for additional food um, or um, just to get away from the site. So that's one of the reasons to make sure we have a good solid plan in place from each of these um, uh, property owners to eradicate the rats before they have the opportunity to spread to other parts of the county. Um, in terms of the um, what happens after five o'clock, um, at that point in time, it's really dependent on the property owners to determine uh, what their next steps will be. So um, in the event that there are still people um, at the site, and again, we don't know if that's gonna be the case, it will be up to the property owners to determine the best way to have those folks removed. Um, they could certainly take the position that they're going to clean up the site and try to do the eradication around people if they're still going to be there. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you read the order, um, it's really the property owner's responsibility to have those folks removed. And we're going to rely on the property owners to do what they need to do in order to make that happen. Next question, Hunter Sions, WCNC. Hi there. Um, I know one of these is for Gibby. Um, the other may be for Karen. But Gibby, um, you alluded to this uh, just a minute ago. But with the, I guess, timely efforts to eradicate these rats, what are your concerns on how quickly they could move into other areas since this is so close to um, other neighborhoods and uptown, things of that nature, of becoming a a bigger problem than the area that it's in. And then Karen, um, what about, I have some people asking me, you know, they were able to take two totes to the hotels and they're wondering, you know, what happens to their belongings that are still left behind? Um, is there still an effort underway to get some storage so they don't just get all that stuff trashed? So in terms of the, the infestation on the site, um, obviously, uh, rats multiply um, and they multiply rapidly and that's our biggest concern that's why we put the time constraints on this um, order that we have put on the order and the sooner we get pest control in there to control the situation the better we're going to be off in in terms of spread um, so the, the intent is that um, at least within the next 72 hours that the eradication begins um, and will happen as quickly as possible. The pest control companies that are being contacted have experience with this and know how to control this population. And so again, the sooner the better. Uh, but I, I would um, advise folks that live around the area just to be um, aware of their surroundings and if they see any potential rodent um, activity on their properties, um, that they contact pest control as quickly as they can. Next question, Mark Becker, WSOC. I can, Karen, can Karen answer that question? Yeah, Dina, yeah. Uh, to clarify your numbers, 
Uh, wait, 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 Mark, 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 Mark. Karen had one more question that she needed to answer for Hunter. Can you just give her one second? Go ahead, Karen. Oh. We'll go to Mark. Oh, thank you. So as far as the remaining belongings, uh, the grassroots organizations were helping people uh, yesterday get belongings to uh, storage facilities. We also had family members or friends were coming and picking up items uh, for people as well. Uh, and they were con continuing to strategize on what to do with any belongings that they wanted to uh, keep. Mark? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, your number is 60, uh, 150 yesterday and 60 roughly today. So the, a total of 210 or thereabouts. And to follow that up, we were out this morning and a gentleman said he came up there yesterday, tried to fill, or couldn't make it yesterday to fill out paperwork, went this morning to fill out paperwork and was told there may not be room for him. Um, and And so... I, I don't know if that's he's one who might have been turned away or if there's any recourse later or what, what happens with somebody like that. So I would say that we started taking names for folks that uh, were eligible that were at part of this encampment area that we were trying to relocate on Wednesday that we did uh, have more people appear yesterday and they were able to get their name on a list if we could confirm that they had a tent and had been living in that area. It was a strong collaboration to really help make sure that the, you know, the people that really needed to leave urgently uh, were prioritized for a space. So I can't speak to the particulars of this individual, uh, but I do know that we work to make sure through our grassroots and our outreach staff to really make sure that everyone in that area was able to gain access. Okay, just to make sure that the number is right, about 210. Is that correct then, Karen or Dina? Correct. That's what we have. Um, that is who we have today. And then staff are triaging at the actual hotels. And we'll have a, uh, a confirmed number later. But that is, where, that is what we have today. Next question is Courtney Cole, WBTV. Uh, my first question, Gibby, could you clarify again? Did you say 8 a.m. tomorrow for cleanup? Well, actually, um, the the clock starts at 5 p.m. the 5 p.m. this afternoon. Um, I, I am talking to most of the property owners. Um, they plan to have people on site over the weekend to clean up. They have 72 hours to get that done um, and to get the eradication started. So um, some of them could conceivably start this afternoon, but the other thing that they're waiting to see is whether there's still going to be people on their properties. So I would imagine, based on our conversations, that most of them will start tomorrow. Got you. Next part, either for Karen or Dina. Um, I know you said you all have been working with grassroots to get people. You're not turning them away. Is it too late if at 5 o'clock tonight people are like, hey, I still need a place. I haven't got a form. I haven't got to the hotel. I've been at work. Can they still find a way to get there? So what our strategy is, is that as individuals are do, if that does happen, they are going to be able to access roof above's nightly winter shelter through the weekend, just to make sure that they do have a safe place to go. And we will be uh, at the hotels and uh, working to make sure that anyone that uh, comes this weekend, we will be able to get them situated on Monday. Next question, Joe Bruno, WSOC. A question for Gibby and a question for Dina. Gibby, what are the health risks for the people that may want to stay around uh, while the pest control is going on this weekend. I imagine it isn't the best idea to be near that spray when people are eradicating the rats. And for Dina, my question for you is, how have your conversations been with the city manager since yesterday's press conference? But our recommendation would not be for people to be around while pest control is um, proceeding with the plans to eradicate these rats. There will likely be a combination of methods used um, that will include poison um, across the board. So it, it is not a good situation for people to be in, and that was one of the reasons for 
um, relocating these individuals before that process started. So again, would not recommend that people be on the property while, while this is occurring. Uh, and to your second question, Joe, I have not spoken to the city manager since the press conference yesterday. Next question, Brett Jensen, WBT Radio. Thanks. Um, I'm curious, a couple real quick questions. In terms of these campments, is there anything to prevent, once these rats are eradicated and everything else and the site cleaned up, is there anything to prevent from these people going back there and leaving the hotels and this just maybe happening all over again? Well, I mean, you know, it's, again, I think it goes back to the property owners doing what they can. If, if they don't want these folks camping on their property, then they have to do what they need to do to secure their property. I mean, this is private property. So the county doesn't have any jurisdiction there. So if folks are concerned about that, they need to make sure they take those necessary steps. And Gabby, the other question I have for you is in terms of the other camps around the area and up and around uptown, is there anything getting close to like what we've seen, the one that you had to issue the health order for? Are there other camps that are getting close to that same situation? Um, just a couple of things. Number one, some of, some of the property owners we know are planning to put up fences, permanent fences around their property to prevent this from happening again. So we know that is gonna happen on some of the sites. Um, I am working with my staff to, to have a look at some of the other encampments to make sure that we're not seeing similar things in those areas. And um, I, I do believe exactly what um, the manager has been saying is this is a community issue, a community wide issue, and we need the community to come together to address this issue on a bigger level um, and, and, and to figure out what we're going to do long term of, around these kinds of encampments because the potential for what we're seeing at North End to happen at other encampments um, is, is just as good there as it is as the place we're working on right now. So we'll continue to evaluate those spots and try to stay on top of that. But um, in the long term, it would be good if we could avoid what we what we've seen happen out here to this week. Next question, Lauren Lindstrom, Charlotte Observer. I wanted to ask a little bit about the funding of this effort. I know that there's some utilization of FEMA funds to reimburse for hotels under some COVID. Um, allotments there, but I'm, I'm wondering about meals and some of the behavioral health services and, and other kind of wraparound things. Like what does the funding picture look like there? So that all is being funded um, either through CARES funding or for FEMA funding at this point. And we'll continue to maximize and leverage that uh, funding source uh, until it is no longer available. Next question, Lana Harris, WCNC. There. I hope you can hear me a little bit better now. Um, we were told by one of the groups out there that the hotels are operating like a shelter, have people leave in the morning at a certain time, have to be back in the hotel at a certain time, um, kind of regulating that movement. And one of them see if that was true, if you knew anything about that, if there are parameters to the people staying there, and um, you know what you guys think about that. Well, we really didn't hear you much better, um, but Karen, did you get any of that? I think it has to do whether or not people have to leave the, the hotel during the day or something like that. That's how I understood it. And so as far as uh, kind of guidelines at the hotel, people are able to be there uh, during the day. There is a curfew in the evening, uh, and that's really just more for the safety of everyone that is in the hotel, that we want to make sure that everyone is, you know, back and where they're supposed to be. There's exceptions for folks that there's like, because there are a number of people there that do have jobs. Um, so we do have exceptions for them, but people are able to be there during the day. We just do ask that there is a, t uh, I believe it's a nine o'clock curfew at those hotels. Next up is Hunter Sions, WCNC. Just following up to Lauren's question about the FEMA and CARES funding, I know that it sounds like this will be, you at least have given it 90 days, but what is this, like a rough amount of what this is totally going to cost from FEMA and CARES funding? And then also, Karen, is this a one strike system for people in these hotels uh, in order if they, you know, bring a substance in or aren't in by nine o'clock? I mean, is it a three strike system or a one strike? 
So as far as like the, the rules or guidelines um, for everyone's safety at the hotel, we're, we have staff that are there that are trained to work with people and have been working with people for years uh, who have experienced homelessness. Uh, so we don't believe that it's not to be designed as a punitive, that it's a one strike, two strike, three strikes. It's everything is, is uh, individual based on what is else is going on with that individual so uh it, everything i would say is but case by case and hunter i don't have a, a a dollar amount for you on on all the costs but we can try to pull something together for you okay thank you dina gibby i want to go back this is brett again i want to go back to uh hunter's question earlier uh to start the press conference um, and I know we're asking you to be health director and help distribute the vaccine, and now we're asking you to be help determine what's in terms of being an exterminator. So, uh, in terms of that, with the rats maybe going into other places, in a, I know this is a weird question, but do we have a, a sense, or do you guys have a sense of just how infested with rats this place was, and what, and how big is the danger of these rats going to other places if these places are cleared up and before the exterminator can get there? Um, at this point, with the time frame that we're looking at, we're we're fairly comfortable because the the property owners have a real interest in getting their property cleaned up and getting this this rat situation taken care of quickly, um, which will prevent a lot of spread. Um, you know, one of the things you're concerned about is when you clean up these properties, you take away the food source number one, and you uncover. Um, places where the rats might be nesting and those sorts of things. Um, but uh, the, the, the timeline and the way these the property owners are working is it, it's sort of like a one-two punch. So we're hoping that as much as possible, we can manage um, any spread from this particular infestation. I, the concern is that there's always the possibility that some of, the, some of this is gonna spread outside of that area and it's just necessary for people to be aware of that. Um, I don't have, I, I really don't have projections on how many rats we have, um, but all we, all we know is with the burrows that we've seen, uh, the feces that we've seen, and the number of rats that have actually been seen is that we've got quite a few. Um, so again, the need for a short time frame in, in the cleanup and the eradication. Next question, please. I'll jump in again. Dina, yesterday I had a lengthy conversation with uh, Sheriff McFadden, um, and he said the biggest problem that he had or the biggest issue that he had in terms of trying to help was that no one from the county ever called him. He said the only person that ever spoke to him were two separate fire captains uh, that reached out to him, including one um, late you know, the night of the order. Uh, do you think that was maybe just a, a breakdown in communication or something like that? Because he said, look, he goes, all he was looking for were logistics and questions that he was asking the two fire captains couldn't answer. Do you think maybe that was part of the problem? Well, you know, I can certainly appreciate that. But, you know, I called him twice and I texted him once and I said, please call me. I need your help. And he never bothered to respond. So um, as much as I love our sheriff, that's just not an accurate statement. Next question, please. Have any of the property owners submitted their pest removal plans yet? We've not received the final plans yet. We believe that we'll start receiving those tomorrow from most of the property owners, but we, we don't have an, a, a finalized plan in hand at this point. Do you know what company they're looking at using for the extermination? I wouldn't be surprised if my um, environmental health staff didn't have that information, but I don't have that with me. Next question, please. Hey, Dina, I, I expect that this is probably front and center for a lot of staff as far as long-term solutions are concerned. I know yesterday you spoke about the idea of some of these tiny houses and property owners uh, hopefully willing to work with um, some of their own land. Are there any other um, solutions, long-term solutions that you and staff are looking at to bring before the board that other cities have worked on as well? 
Not really at this time. And we're really, you know, we focus on affordable housing all the time. And we're looking at a whole host of different things and trying to do what we can to create new units. Um, and so we're really a little bit in the research phase on this tiny home project. Um, so we're just going to have to continue to work through it and, and see what we can do to create more capacity in the system. Next question, please. Last call for questions. I, I'll end with one um, if nobody else has one. Uh, do you I mean, just reflect on the past couple of days here going um, from when the order was issued to now when people are going to have to be officially out of 10 city? Do you think the count, are you proud of how the county has handled this process? Well, you know, I always think that there's ways that you can do things better. I mean, um, it, you know, we we can go back and we'll do a postmortem like we always do on everything that we do when we have any kind of crisis or any kind of situation. We go back and try to do things that we think, um, you know, can improve the situation. I think, you know, there's always room to be better around communication and how we communicate with people and when we communicate with people. I think that would have been potentially, um, you know, a, a place where we could have done better. Um, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to secure those transportation resources, um, learned a lesson there about, you know, how to go about doing that a little bit differently and, and who you can really rely on to help you out when you're in a crisis. Um, but I think at the end of the day, when you look at what we've done, we've relocated over 210 people into safe housing um, where they have access to food, three meals a day and snacks and uh, wraparound services and job supports and mental health supports. Um, I think that our team feels really good at the end of the day about what we've been able to accomplish in 72 hours. It's, it's pretty remarkable. And again, I will say that we don't do this by ourselves. We can't thank our grassroots organizations and our nonprofit partners and our volunteers and our staff enough for coming together to get this done. Um, it's, I think at the end of the day, it's been an, an, a truly extraordinary effort that we've been able to accomplish this in such a short period of time and really keep people safe. It's, it's, I, I feel good about it. Dina, how many of those yellow? Dina, how many of those uh, yellow cabs? Uh, that's uh, did they reach out to you and just say, "Hey, we want to offer our services"? And and how many did they help provide you with as a private company? So we we got um, their names through Muhammad Genetian from the Hospitality and Tourism Alliance, and and he hooked us up with them um, and helped coordinate that. And so I'm going to ask Karen because she's the one that coordinated that on the ground um, in terms of how many of those. I think it was. Well, I'll let you answer, Karen. So I don't have that number in front of me as far as uh, yellow cabs go. I know that we did have three limousines with peak limousine vans and a number of MTS, but I was actually on the other side of uh, checking people in yesterday, so I don't have that number. Any further questions? Thanks for being available again today, guys. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great weekend, everyone.